Hey, I think this is working now. Okay, sorry for the slight delay. I think we are ready to start finally. Um, this presentation is Drupal 8 teaming deep dive. Uh, this presentation is going to include a lot of PHP, so maybe if you are just pure teamer who is not interested at all about PHP, this session might not be for you. I'm not offended, offended if you leave at this point or at any point later during the session. So uh, let's start uh, by introducing myself. So my name is uh, Lauri Escola. Uh, I'm one of the current Drupal 8 team system, team system maintainers in, in Drupal 8. Um, I work for Finnish Drupal agency called Droid as a team leader. I, I love kittens. Uh, I guess I hope there is other people who love kittens also because they are awesome and cute. Um, and I, I keep passionately adding them to Drupal core. And beside that, I like to break Partic. And maybe in future, if there's any other new teams, I like to break them also. So let's proceed for the topic of today, which is the team system of, of Drupal. So here I have an image of the current team system, uh, a simplified version of that. Uh, it goes from the left to the right. Uh, and here, this is the last, uh, last point from the team system perspective, what happens. So I'm going to explain all of these steps, what is going to happen in each of the steps, and what they should be used for. I'm going to give some practical uh, tips how, when you're creating a module, how you should be creating the team hooks, and basically how the wall system should be used. But let's start with, uh, with the team system itself. So uh, all, of the, uh, all of the code examples I have prepared on my slides can be found from a demo module that is on GitHub that you can download. Um, you can download it and play around a little bit and do whatever you want to. Uh, so let's start with the hook team first, which is the first step in the team system when something is being output for the, for the browser, for the, uh, for the markup. So on the left side, you can see a hook team implementation uh, over here. So it is a function, a hook that lives in the module file. And over here, you can see that it returns an array where first key is sandwich, which includes an array. And inside that array, uh, we are specifying a set of rules for a team hook called sandwich. Um, so the most common thing that you will need to do inside this hook team implementation that you are creating is to specify the variables that will be always passed for the template. These should be the variables that are always available in the template. Uh, the, the, the variables that the teamer can trust are always there. Uh, so what we have here is we have attributes. Uh, we have name, bread, cheese, veggies, protein, and condiments. So these different things will always be available throughout uh, the team system. Uh, so from the beginning till the end in the template. On the right side, you can see a usage of a hook team implementation. So we are creating a render array, which will eventually use this thing. So this is a declaration for this, kind of like uh, specifies what, what is going to be inside here. So you can see name, so it means this. You can see bread, it means this. You can see cheese, and it maps over there. Uh, as you can see, some of them are arrays, some of them are strings. Uh, so, that all, so we also specify here what type they should be. So condiments should be always an array. Protein should be always a string, because we specify the, the default type in here. There's also some additional items in the uh, render arrays, like attached, which are not specified here, with, which will be used by the render system. Uh, if you try to specify any additional variables in the render array and pass them for the team system, they won't be available in the team system unless they are specified in the hook team implementation. So adding a new variable here called, uh, so we have red, maybe, type of sandwich 
or type, it wouldn't go for the team system at all because it's not specified in the variables of the hook team implementation. The next step uh, after creating the render array and hook team implementation. So if everything is specified correctly, if the hook team implementation is found, what is going to be triggered is the team suggestions. Uh, so team suggestions are a way to create this kind of things. Uh, a, po a possibility to override a, a template or a preprocess function based on, on some information or logic that you have built on this hook team implementation. So when there is a node hook team implementation, how it always works is that you can override the basic node template or the basic node preprocess function based on the type of the node. So if you have a overriding template, let's say for an article node type, you could create node dash dash article and it will always override whatever is inside the basic implementation of the template. And you can create these easily by yourself in the, in the team suggestions. This is just an example of a very popular uh, implementation that we have in Drupal core. I would, I would guess most of the teamers has used this at some point. So how to create your own team suggestion? It happens in the, uh, in the hook team suggestions, like I said. Uh, but over here you can see so we have here two sandwiches. So the first sandwich here is the name of the module. And the second sandwich over here uh, in the end is the name of the hook team implementation that we have just created. And what is happening here is I'm creating additional uh, hook team suggestion based for, for, for this sandwich based on the name of the sandwich. So because we have two sandwiches that is being output, there would be two different ways to override the templates. You could override it for Chicago using sandwich dash dash Chicago, or you could uh, override it for the yummy sandwich using the sandwich dash dash yummy. So there's two levels over here. So there is the hook team suggestions, and there is the hook team suggestions alter. The other one can only add new ones, and the alter one can also remove team suggestions that has been added by other module or a team. Um, what do you, well, how it works? The hook team suggestions, you simply just return an array or a string if it's a single val value, and it will create the team suggestions for that team hook implementation. And if you're using the alter, you can see here that there is a reference variable that you can change and add or remove the, uh, the values in that variable, and it will create the team suggestions. Uh, these are very useful because it allows you to do some little bits of logic in a single place, uh, but there might not be that many, that many use cases always to, to, to do this, uh, especially in a custom code. Uh, so debugging these team suggestions, because by default, many of the modules already provide multiple team suggestions. Uh, we have added a tool, which I hope many of you are already familiar, because this is also in Drupal 7. It got backported to Drupal 7, so you can use the same functionality in Drupal 7. But how it works is in the services.jaml file, uh, you simply just set tweak config and uh, over there value debug. Uh, from false to true. So there is like a default uh, services your channel file in the, uh, in the sites folder where you can take a look. They have already, they have predefined the debug to be false. You have to simply just change it in the true and you will get this kind of values uh, like you can see on the bottom in the markup when you reload the page. Uh, and how to use this thing is that you can see here all the different template suggestions available for node templates. So there is the one, the first one. Uh, so this is more specific than the plain node template, but it's the least specific of the different team suggestions. So there is more specific one. So the first one is the, the one for the view mode. The second one is for a node type. And if multiple of these are provided, the one that is most top 
will always win. So let's say if you, if you have both article and teaser, it would only load the article template. Uh, also, what is handy, because right now in Drupal core we have multiple base teams, uh, and also templates might come from a module. We have a tool that you can use to locate where is the current template being output from. Uh, and you can find the info here. So let's say this node template that I'm outputting here is located in the Bartik module. When you're doing this, it might be in, on your custom team, it might be in your, if you're using some base team like Zen or Bootstrap, it might be from there. Or it might be from Classy in Drupal core, or it might be from stable team. So there's multiple different locations. And for that reason, it's very handy to use this tool to uh, look where is the actual template being printed from. Uh, so the next step after the team suggestions is preprocess functions. And uh, we have two levels again. So we have the template preprocess and we have the team preprocess. Uh, so template preprocess is a single function level. You can there can be only be one template preprocess function. It is not a a proper hook, so you can see here, a template preprocess function. It's pr not pre prefixed with the name of the module, it's prefixed with the name template. And because of that, it means that there can be only one function, and only the module that is providing the hook team uh, implementation should be creating this template preprocess function. This is a very, very uh, common mistake that uh, people make because they copy some code from Drupal core because we have a lot of template preprocess functions in Drupal core. They would copy something from there and they would still have the template preprocess function implemented in their uh, own module. So what could happen is if it works, obviously the, the module that is providing the hook team implementation doesn't provide a template preprocess function because it works, otherwise it would uh, cause a fatal error. Um, but if it doesn't provide it yet, you could do it, and it would work, uh, even in a team or a module, no matter. But what, what if that module at some point provides template preprocess function? It will break your site. So you, sh you are not supposed to, supposed to do that. It will break your site very hard, so don't do it. Uh, even though it's very not that likely that the module will provide the template preprocess function, but the whole harm that it could cause for your site is, is so high, like the damage that I wouldn't do it ever. So what you should be doing instead is to use the hook one, which is prefixed with the name of the module or the team. And then in the end, it will have the name of the team, uh, uh, hook team implementation or the team suggestion. Uh, so what I suggest you to use the preprocess for is to modifying a variable before it goes to template. If it's from other module, or if you're providing a major part of functionality. A good example would be in Drupal core contextual links. It's, it mainly works in the preprocess function, and it attaches additional render arrays into the additional items in the render arrays to provide the contextual links of Drupal. Uh, but preprocess functions are not meant to, that you provide, let's say, a full node into a team hook into the team system from your custom code. And then in preprocess function, you split that node into the actual data that you want to put into the template. That is not what preprocess functions are meant to. Basically, you are removing uh, some abilities to override, override these things. You are also um, not documenting what data is going to be available in the template, because of the hook team implementation is supposed to be the documentation. What is available in the template when you get there? What is available during the all wall road, the wall time we are in the team system? Uh, so don't add new variables in the, in the preprocess function. If you need to add new variables over there, I would rather create a new team function for that, uh, because it's a new type of template, new team, hook, uh, team, ho new team hook implementation, because you need new type of data. And what is the most important one? Uh, what is the worst mistake of the all? Is in the preprocess function, start pre building your own logic. Let's say, start loading entities, or start doing some little bit more crazier things, or loading menu items using the, the APIs that the other modules are doing. Uh, preprocess functions are not meant for that also. 
so please don't do it. Do it somewhere else in the controller. I'm going to show another way of doing it pretty soon, which is the right way, or right way that, that the way I think is the right way. So uh, if you have preprocess functions, Drupal Core has a lot of preprocess functions, which is not good. Uh, we are using preprocess functions the way I don't suggest people to use preprocess functions. Uh, we have a plan to remove those preprocess functions and move the logic elsewhere where, where it is supposed to be. Uh, you can see these three issues if you have your own preprocess functions, maybe in your module or your client side. You can take a look how, how Wim has been removing preprocess functions from Drupal Core, and maybe it will tell you why is it a bad idea to do the preprocess function. Also, there's a lot of interesting comments on these issues, like what is the problem uh, of using the preprocess functions. So the last part in the team system is the template. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about using Tweak. So Drupal 8 has a new templating engine called Tweak. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later, but I'm just going to show here what, it, what in this particular case would the template look like. So we have the same data that I showed you earlier in the team hook implementation. We are using it here to create very, very simple kind of a markup structure. Nothing very special. Uh, so now we are getting to the part of, so why not do you use the preprocess functions, or what do you use instead of preprocess functions? So there is a system called render system, which is very very tied to team system, and render system is used to create uh, the form API of Drupal, let's say, and when you are using a text field form element, what happens is that in the render system, which is, over, uh, which is on the top, uh, we are pre-populating a render array, which then goes to the team system, which will render it based on the data it got from the render system. And that is the right way of populating your render array. If, so let's say um, th the popular use case that people have is that they have multiple controllers are using the same team hook implementation, and they don't want to multiply the logic inside the controller to build the render array, and they move the code to preprocess function. But that is not the way it should work. It should work instead so that you create a render, uh, render element, which is actually a system which just simply builds render arrays, and you should use that to create your render array. So how render system works is that, so there is a render element uh, which has similar kind of metadata as hook team implement implementation has. So you can specify there like what are the default values and uh, you can specify uh, what kind of callback should be called and which point. And that data is also something that you can alter very easily. I'm going to show how. Uh, and after that, there are some pre-render callbacks that are specified in the render element that will be called. And based on that, it will create an, a render array and send it for the team system. Team system doesn't know, it doesn't, or it knows that it comes from a render element, but it doesn't, in multiple cases, you don't really have to care about that. It's just one variable that is passed, that this is coming from render element. But the re team system doesn't really care whether it's a render element or a, a render array that you have created yourself. And you can use that same hook team implementation using multiple different render elements, or you can create one manually in your controller. And here, the data is always the same, because you have specified it here, and it doesn't change at any point. So some little bit more complicated things to understand is that uh, so if you're using a render system, it will also go to post-render callbacks. So you will have a possibility to alter the markup even after team system has rendered it into something. Uh, it can be handy sometimes. Uh, let's say, because this part, the rendering can be cached. If there is just one thing that you need to change, let's say if there is a uh, username, uh, but, ev but everything else is cacheable, you can over here, you can take everything else rendered over here, you can put the placeholder, and it can be repl replaced here. There is actually a, that, that was a way that was done for a long time, 
without any other additional systems, but now there is actually additional uh, logic in the Drupal core to manage that kind of uh, functionality. I'm not going to go there because that's more of how things are cached than how to use the team system. So let's forget that for from this presentation. But there is a good presentation from Fabian and Wim that, you, that I suggest you to, to watch. It's from the DrupalCon. Uh, so after the post render callbacks, what happens is that we create a markup object out of that out of this. And then that basically means that now we are final. That's what we have. And that shouldn't be modified at all anymore. So how to create these render elements? Uh, so I have a very simple sandwich render element over here. So we specify that Brett is by default sword dog. We specify that uh, condiments are over here. This is not how you actually could do, like you couldn't set really values over here because this is static data, so you can't translate it or anything, but that's just, that's just a demo that what you practically could do. Um, so you should do this in a pre-render uh, function instead of in the get info. But you can specify here the default values if they are static. Uh, let's say one good example is the team or attached. Um, over here, what happens? is you can see we are, instead of using hash team, we are calling hash type, which means that it will call this render element, which is specified here in the top. And uh, it will pass these values over here, merge these two things together, and call any pre-render pre functions specified over here. And then it will pass it for the team system. And then it will call any post-render functions that are available over there. You can override any of the values that are provided over here, here in the render array. Uh, easily, like just simply provide the data and it will override the value over here, uh, coming from the render element. Uh, so what we will end up having is a render array which would match with this. And over here, I'm showing how to create a pre-render function. So pre-render function is where you actually should be putting the data inside the render array. Uh, so over here, you can see that I have empty name. We have pre-render. And over here, you can set the name into something that is useful. Or you can set condiments. And these, these will be provided for the team system later on when it's been actually rendered. If you need to create uh, kind of like a preprocess function or pre-render function. In the uh, team, you can use the hook element info alter and add your own pre-render function for the list of available pre-render functions. And you can specify at which point should this pre-render function be run. Should it be in the end, should it be at first, or whatever you need. And you, you give the name of the function and provide the function, and it will be called. Uh, so all of this is available in this GitHub module. Uh, we will proceed to the next section of the presentation. Uh, so last part of this, uh, this, this section, I want to give a brief introduction what is actually happening right now, what are people working on, what are we trying to improve. So the first thing, the most important or, and the, most, the largest thing we are working on is the the team system component library. And um, that is kind of like a kind of stuck right now because we don't know what we need to do. So if any of you maybe know what we should do, maybe you could help. Uh, we've had several conversations at DrupalCon New Orleans and the front end United. So we kind of know some of the requirements that we have, what we want to do. But it's still very vague what is actually what we need to do. So if anyone has any ideas for this, uh, the issue number is over here. Please give us any, any feedback that you might have. There is a lot of information on that issue. So it might be hectic. Um, another thing that some people are working on and are very interested of, they are kind of related, uh, but is to supersede the backbone uh, JavaScript framework in Drupal core with a new client-side framework, which hasn't been decided, or, or do we need to do this, haven't been decided yet also, but a lot of people would like to work on this. So maybe if you have any insights for this one, maybe you can go comment on the issue also. 
um, it could be very helpful because it's also very, very stuck. So let's proceed to the tweak. Uh, so how should tweak be used? Um, the very basics of tweak. So um, in order to say something in tweak, you can use the square brackets. In order to do something, you need to use square bracket and a percentage. In order to comment, you need to use square bracket and a hash. So these are the three different syntaxes that Twig, Twig has. There is no, no more or no less. These are always available. Um, so let's start with the printing. How does printing work in Twig? Uh, so in Twig, uh, we have one syntax of accessing data inside uh, inside variables. It can be multiple different things when you say sandwich.cheese in, uh, in your tweak file. So what do we do when you try to print this, when you, when, you cr when you create a template which has this, is it will be compiled into PHP. And what it will do, it will try to access all of these different uh, types of data. So it will first try if sandwich is an array, and if cheese is a key in that array, if it's not an array, uh, it will proceed if this is an object and there is a property called cheese. If that fails also, if it's not, if it's object but there is no property called cheese, it will test uh, if there is any uh, dynamic properties that we could access with the PHP magic. If that, is not cr if that fails also, it doesn't find anything, it will test if there is a method with that name. You can see that we are, it doesn't look like we would be calling a method, but it could be calling a method. It could be even calling a method called get uh, using the get method convention, or is cheese using the is method convention, or it could be even trying to look for a dynamic method. So this could be this could mean multiple different things in Twig, and this is being run. This is being created every time you output something in Twig, and it's being run every time something is being output from Twig. Which might, might sound a little bit slow, because it's a lot of logic, like to print one variable. Uh, there is a way to get around that, because it actually is pretty slow to do that. Uh, so if you need to actually render a lot of templates, uh, there is a tweak PHP package that you can just simply install on your server, and it will compile that, that part of Twig. Instead of compiling it into PHP, it will compile it into C. And that will run a lot faster than running it in PHP. Uh, it's just simply just install it, and you don't need to do anything else. It will just work. It's magic, and it's pretty sweet. So how to debug variables, how to, see, how to find your data in um, Drupal core? One of the best ways that I figure out right now is to use the kint, fu uh, kit, kint function, which is provided by a kint module that is bundled into devil module. So if you, if you download devil, and an enable module called kint, you can get this kind of output out of, the, out of the data that you have. It can be a little bit difficult to figure out what can you access, because you can see that there's a lot of protected properties that you can't really access from the tweak. So you have to go to the, to the methods, available methods, and figure out what is the right method to be used to get some, type, uh, uh, some of the data. Um, so let's say uh, let's let's go quickly through how to use functions in Twig. So there is two types of functions. There is functions and there is filters in Twig. Uh, filters is nothing that we could really compare in PHP. Uh, they're just simply very simple functions that are meant to manipulate a, whatever is inside a variable into something else. So it will take uh, this variable from here as a parameter for this uh, this function and return it in a different form. And the length filter is a good example. It takes this as a parameter, and it returns a length of that variable as a result. There is filters call, called fida out or uppercase, and they will just transform it into something else. Tick functions are usually more complicated functions, and they are not to be uh, manipulating the content. They might return something out of them, that is printable. But a good example is attach library. It doesn't really uh, output anything. It simply just attaches a library for that template every time it's being output. Uh, there is a lot of different functions available for, for Drupal 
also like Drupal specific, like Gint function, which is provided by the Devil module. And then there is this uh, address library, which is provided by Drupal core. Uh, so I mentioned a without filter, which is very handy in Drupal, uh, in Drupal 8. Uh, so we used to have the height function in uh, Drupal 7. It's replaced by a without filter. And what it does is it simply just removes these array items while you're printing a variable. And how it works uh, is that if you want to output content without comments and links, you just simply use the without filter. In Drupal 7, you would have to use the hide function, which instead marks that array as printed. So when you print it, it won't print it. And the problem with that is if you, if you try to render it again and print it again, it's, it's still, these things are still hidden. These two values are still hidden. It's permanent change, not only one time. So this is only one time change. So it's more hand, it's a little bit more handy and a little bit more safe because you can actually see what is hidden and where. Uh, so Twig has some additional logic to manage markup because it's actually templating language. Uh, so one of the uh, very, very handy ways to manage markup that I've, that I've found out is the blocks that Twig provides. So you can create in a template this kind of blocks that are overreadable by other templates. So how it works is that you can create another template and tell, OK, this template is extending another template. In that template, everything that you put is blocks. You can only provide blocks. And how those works is that they, the blocks that you provide in a template that is extending another template will override those specific blocks from that template. But everything else will be the same. So over here, I have the page template. Uh, probably everyone who has seen page template, it's a very huge template with a lot of information. Uh, but I'm, I have here only one block, which is the title. And below that and on top of it, there is a lot of logic. I'm creating another template, which is overridden template for the front page using the theme suggestions. And here I tell, OK, I'm extending page template. And what I have here is only one block. And this will override this bit of code, change the h1 element, h2 element into h1. And everything else will be the same. And then you need to only modify that markup in a one template, which is the main template. Very handy. Another way uh, of creating your own logic in Twig is to use macros. And how macros work is that they're like functions in PHP. Uh, they're a little bit more li uh, limited. They are more isolated. Uh, so you can create a macro, and uh, you can call it in your in your trick file like uh, like a function. So what is the difference is that if you if you say here macro list, it won't be available automatically. You have to specify an import that you want to have the macros from that file, and you say import self as elements. So then you will have a elements variable which has all the macros that you have specified in that template. So I'm using a list macro to create a list of items. And why I'm doing this is because I have this if else for the wrapper. So why I'm not doing two different ifs, like saying in the beginning, if this and add opening diff and in the end do the same if to close it is because it will so there is two things one is that you have the same if in two places there is, so there is a risk that they will work differently so one either the if is wrong or someone modifies the variable in between of the two places uh, another thing another reason why i don't do it is because of um it will break the code highlighting of your text editor. So this will keep your code highlighting working all the time. So the rule number one in Drupal 8 is that markup should live inside Twig template, not in PHP. And you won't have that many trouble as long as your markup is inside Twig files, not in PHP. If you have your markup in PHP, you will run into all weird kind of problems. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about that. 
why do we have so many problems about putting markup into PHP? So in Drupal 8, we have this new fancy system called Auto Escape. Uh, have, how many of you have heard of Auto Escape? Do you want to raise your hand if you have heard of it? Maybe a few people, maybe 10 people, maybe like one tenth of everyone. Cool. At least some of you have heard of this. So Auto Escape was the thing that Dries mentioned in his keynote last year in DrupalCon Barcelona as a reason why Drupal 8 was not shipped yet. So he's, he talked something about Twig. It was, it was auto escape, what he was talking about. So this is a very important topic because it was blocking the Drupal 8 release. It was considered important enough that we can block the release because of this. Uh, so what is auto escaping? Let's start with what is escaping. So escaping means that when we escape a string that will that we will convert all the characters that could be possibly considered as HTML in the by the browser into UTF encoded characters. Like, like here, this is, uh, this is escaped string. So you can see lower than, greater than, which means that the browser won't render it as HTML. And then when you look it on the browser, like how it looks visually, you can see that um, you can see the HTML on the browser, which is very confusing. Like, why is my HTML on the browser? Uh, because of auto-escaping, it's escaping, but it happens automatically for every string that you print. So in Twig, if you print something, if you print a string, it will be escaped automatically. So you are not able to provide a HTML in variables that you have set in PHP. If you create markup in Twig file, it won't be escaped at all. It's all safe because we know that if it's written in Twig file, it's something that the teamer has written, we, we can consider it as safe. But if you just create a new variable with some bunch of markup in a preprocess function, it will be escaped automatically by, the, by Twig. So why do we want to do this? Like, What is the reason we want to escape everything automatically? Like, A lot of people say that's very inconvenient like, because of... Uh, I want to put my markup from PHP. OK, maybe it's not the best way to put markup out, out from there. But there is also another reason why we do it. So here you can see the, the main reason for the vulnerabilities in the Drupal core is XSS. 33% of all the vulnerabilities against Drupal core, 33% of the times you, have, you are updating your Drupal site because of a security release. It's because of XSS. And what is even more fascinating is that 52% of the time you are security updating your modules, it is because of XSS. And for this reason, we want to get rid of XSS bugs because we want to remove the need of security updating our sites by 50%. At least we think that we could remove a major part. Maybe not all of them, but maybe a major part. And Actually, there has been already some XSS vulnerabilities against Drupal 8 modules I saw on Twitter. And it was funny because all of them were caused by using a raw filter or using some other weird ways to get around auto-escaping. And immediately, these modules will have XSS. So it's very easy to spot these modules. It's very easier than it used to be in the past. So. I'm not going to explain how to use auto-escape because there is no need to use auto-escape because of it just happens, it's automatic. Uh, so I'm going to explain how to get rid of auto-escape. So the first way, the way that I suggest you to use is to create a render array instead of just simply creating a string. Uh, that cannot be done everywhere, but wherever you can do a render array, that is the right way. Uh, here I have the simplest render array possible, which is hash markup uh, and some markup. And it won't escape it because it's a render array and it's supposed to be having markup inside it. So hash markup is an exceptional uh, render array item that we have created. What happens for whatever you put inside hash markup, it will be XSS admin filtered, which means that we will remove the script tags away from there, but it will, re, uh, it, will, it will keep all the whitelisted HTML elements without any trouble. Another way to get rid of uh, auto-escaping is to use formatable markup. 
Formidable markup is the um, format string from Drupal 7, but it's now an object. So if you create a formidable markup object, it won't escape. It has also its caveats. There is some problem, problematic cases. So these are the major ways to get rid of it. So when are these escape strings actually safe? Because of, it also matters where do you print your variables. So whenever your escape string is being printed in the HTML node, it can be considered safe. But if you're not in the HTML node, the string won't be safe. What does that mean? Here, uh, the first example is I'm printing a escape string inside an HTML element. Like, not inside the element, inside the opening tag of an HTML element. Like, you could imagine, not the same rules apply anymore when you're inside an HTML element opening tag as would apply when you're inside actual HTML that can be rendered. So this is not safe. Don't do it. Don't output your variables inside HTML elements. There is one exception, which is attributes object, which you can output inside the HTML opening tags because it can be trusted. But no, don't put your user data inside there in any format. Another good example is href, which has a lot of special functionality in, uh, to be an attribute. It creates the target of a link, like we, where should a link be targeted. And that could be mis misused multiple different ways. And one of them is to put JavaScript inside there. And what I have here is a bit of the JavaScript where no character would be escaped by Drupal's auto escaping. So if you click the href, if you, if you click the, this link, it will pop up XSS uh, alert window on your browser. So how to get rid of that? We have added a new uh, placeholder, colon URL, which you can use for the URLs. Don't output your, uh, your variables inside uh, order, inside the uh, HTML opening elements. That's how you avoid the other problem. There's some other problems also. Uh, one of them is that we create a lot of objects now. So when you use T function, it will be an object, so we know that this is a result of a T function or formidable markup. Uh, so if you put a result of T function as an array key, it will create a fatal error because PHP doesn't support object, objects as an array key, even though you can say you can cast it into string, but when it's, as, when it's array key, it won't be called automatically. So if you put translatable markup inside array, array keys, you have to cast them into strings. So one more thing to remind you of is that auto-escaping is only enabled for tweak. So if you use any custom uh, templating engines, you won't have auto-escaping by default. And if you use team functions, you won't have auto-escaping. So don't use team functions, they are deprecated. And for this, right, these reasons also, PHP templating engine got removed from Drupal 8 and got replaced by a Nyancat templating engine. And the reason why it's called Nyancat is because one of the people implementing it said that we want to replace a joke with another joke. So time for questions. I think we have a few minutes time. Um, any questions? OK, there is. Yeah, so if there is any user input inside that uh, URL, then it's not safe. And for the, for the practice, the colon uh, placeholder should be used always. So if you're using like a URL function uh, or any of the URL generators, basically that shouldn't happen at any point. But uh, using the colon is a good idea for j just for the practice. Yeah. Another question? We introduce what? So the question is that 
uh, how does it make safer? Uh, so one of the reasons why a lot of uh, functionality was moved to the templates uh, was security. And how does it make it safer that we introduce filters and macros inside the templates? Uh, so the functionality of all of these different functionalities of Twig, and also the filters that ha has been custom created, are they designed to be used in template? So we can always keep in mind that this thing will be used in template. And we have actually a lot of like different kind of safety measures that we do in the different filters. Like we test for multiple different things and we test for escaping over there uh, because we know that it's always used in a certain way because it's in the Twig template. Because so, so in Twig template, the way you can use these things is more limited than in PHP. And for that reason, we can make more assumptions how things are being used. And for that reason, we have more more safety. And also, uh, one of the uh, things that Twig does is, um, so there is a lot of filters and there is different kind of macros, but it's very limited. What can you do in a Twig file? So you cannot call any PHP function in Twig function in Twig file. You have to specify which PHP functions can be called inside Twig. Another, another thing, which was a huge security problem that we used to have, was uh, that if you provide an object into a Twig template. You could call methods inside objects. So we have limited also the, uh, the, the methods that you can call inside objects. So let's say a good example is that um, you could, you were able to call a delete method of an o in entity object, which basically, basically allows people to delete entities inside templates. But now it has been disabled, so you can't call any delete function, delete method in a Twig file. Any other questions? Yeah? Uh, can you give a example? Because it's very hard if we have from the demo a uh, field and Um, so the question is that how can we specify if um, if there is a render array, if the data inside the render array is empty or not? Um, that's a huge bug that we have in Drupal 8. It used to exist in Drupal 7, but in Drupal 8 this bug is even worse. So, in, so the problem that we have, the underlying problem that we have is that um, at the point that we have the render array, we might not know what data does the render array have? So because of the, we have placeholders, at the point when you are in the template, the data might not be there yet. So the render array might be just a placeholder for data coming in later in the, in the lazy builder. Or it could be even in the worst case, a data that is coming from a big pipe. So it will come in um, like a lot later than the template. So there is not really any way because of these reasons to measure if render array has data or not. Like the different render arrays might have different ways, but there is no way that would apply for everything. And this applies for fields, this applies for views, a lot of different things in views, this applies for blocks, this applies for regions, and all of these has the same problem. And blocks are diverse because they are, if you use big pipe, they will be built uh, by the big pipe after the initial page has been loaded. So what I suggest, what is the solution? Is to start thinking the layouts in a way that it's always there. And if, it's, if something is not always there, then you need to be able to, in the front end somehow, figure out a way to change the layout uh, by using CSS empty, maybe JavaScript. I don't know. Uh, there's different ways depending on the use case. But there is no one solution that would apply for everything. There is a major bug against Drupal 8 of this. Uh, if you want, you can come here and I, I can give you the link. So it includes a lot of more information. What are the reasons? Uh, but that's, there is no one way of fixing it. Any other questions? I guess we have time for one more. If there is no any additional questions, I guess we are finished. Uh, 
Do you have a question? No? OK. Perfect. Then we are finished. Thank you for the, uh, for the day. Uh, we are done. <laughs>